Um, my name is Lenny Ryan, and I am the founder and editor of Mold Magazine, an editorial platform about designing the future of food. Um, we recently published our first issue about designing for the human microbiome, which it also included conversations around uh, genetically modified organisms. Um, and we are just wrapping up our second issue on designing for the table, which is about designing tableware and furniture for shaping dining rituals. I'm so thrilled to be moderating this panel today um, to talk to this incredible group of uh, female entrepreneurs um, and artists all about how we might be able to design food for the future. Um, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves and we'll get right into it. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Robin Shapiro and I co-founded a company called Seek Food. We're sort of directly over there on the second floor and um, all our products are, are healthy, everyday snacks. We have granola, we have energy bites and everything is made with sustainable cricket protein. So you might have heard a thing or two before about eating crickets um, in this sort of like future of food conversation. But what I think is really exciting is that it's here, it's available today, it's sold in stores, we can taste it, we can um, uh, innovate on it, um, and we'll get into a little bit more of a sustainability benefits of that uh, a little later. Before that, I've been working on a, a couple uh, nonprofit projects in the city, building an underground park, working on a rooftop farm, so it seemed like a natural evolution. Hi, my name is Jennifer Farah. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone today at Food Hubs Tech. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sprouts.io Inc. Uh, so we're downstairs. Um, we have an awesome booth. You might see some giant uh, macro and micro greens that are posted. That's actually us. We've got a cool little booth set up. And we're also working uh, with Chef Suzanne Cups of Entitled at the Whitney uh, to make some really awesome light bites and dishes out of the sprouts I of produce that we're growing in our system. So we developed a system for growing uh, produce soil free. Um, it's very easy to use, simple to maintain, and we're working with a number of chefs throughout the city. So please come by and see us uh, downstairs after the talk, and we're happy to chat a little bit more with you guys. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rachel Drury. I'm the founder of Daily Harvest, uh, a company that is working to solve what we believe is a modern eating dilemma the desire to eat very uh, conveniently, but without nutritional compromise. Um, so we're doing this by using the freezer as the vessel. Um, you may have seen our smoothies on Instagram, that's where most people find us. Um, and we are also downstairs if we want to taste some of our delicious treats, we should try them. Hi, I'm Stephanie Barden. I'm an artist and a professor. I teach uh, at NYU in the program that Marion uh, just retired from, and I also teach in the Interactive Telecommunications Program at Tisch at ITP. And my work and the work of my students really deals a lot with food technology, design, climate change. Um, so what really differentiates our panel from the other ones that are being presented uh, this weekend is really the kind of focus on design. And with Mold, our mission is really to engage designers with this challenge of feeding 9 billion people by the year 2050. So I'm really interested in how each of you uses design as a vehicle for the work that you do, and specifically as a lens to, um, you know, as a central motivation for the work. You guys will have to answer that a lot, you guys, because we can mix it up, guys. <laughs> sure, sure. So I think design plays a role in our sort of products in many, in, in a couple different ways. One, as I mentioned before, we're incorporating crickets into our foods. So for people who haven't tried that before, people who have maybe heard a thing or two about that, your first instinct might be, whoa, um, that's not part of the way I've been eating. Um, I've actually been taught that, that insects are, are bad, or are sort of good for you, it's something I want to steer clear of. So uh, we need to look at a number of different ways to help people overcome that hurdle, that fear, uh, fear that hesitancy, and design is, is probably the number one thing that we do. Um, I think when a lot of people see our products, they're like, oh, we love how this looks. Um, I think design plays a big role, you know, people love how your products look too. And so it sort of just kind of hooks people in, uh, as well as what we're doing like really reassures them. 
that this is um, kind of good for them. And we're very much inspired by nature with all of our products. Crickets come from the earth. Um, uh, our sort of fear of them is sort of different than maybe some of the fears that we had heard on the, on the panel earlier, um, sort of being sort of, you know, lab engineer, but crickets come from the earth. And so I think our packaging and the design behind them is really meant to try to drive home that. We have a lot of uh, botanical images on our packaging. And then and one I, of the things that I think yeah. is really interesting between the kind of botanical, like floral images that you guys use in Seek and uh, the, the packaging at Daily Harvest, Daily Harvest kind of has a bit of like a kind of open, happy, scientific uh, approach to it, which I think is a really interesting choice for um, what are kind of uh, very familiar foods like soups and bowls and smoothies. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so something that a lot of people don't realize about frozen food uh, is that when you take produce and you freeze it on the farm, that it's actually higher in nutrient content than the stuff that you're buying at Whole Foods, say. So in order to get people to stop and listen and realize that we were doing something different, we knew that we had to look different. We knew that we couldn't look like, you know, the CPGs that you see in the, the freezer aisle. Um, so, you know, our, our packaging and our, our visual design was really meant to um, get people to, to, you know, stop, think, and listen to what we had to say. Um, you know, and then just from a product design perspective, um, you know, when I go back to what I was saying when I made my introduction about our desire to solve a modern eating dilemma, which is the desire to eat conveniently without any nutritional compromise, um, you know, we knew that we had to be super convenient for, um, you know, to really be able to uh, accomplish what we were trying to accomplish. So, you know, everything that goes into one of our cups is just really thoughtful. Um, and we felt that you know, if, if we're reinventing what a soup could look like, soup is not like a super sexy category. Um, you know, so we had to make sure that our, our packaging looked different and what, insi what went inside looked, um, tasted, felt different. So like when you open one of our cups, you see every single ingredient inside and there's nowhere to hide anything. A lot of people associate frozen food with like preservatives and chemicals and a lot of stuff that we all know is not so good for us these days. So. You know, it's, it's not only the design on the outside, but it's also the design on the inside. And there's also that experience of the consumer <laughs> opening the package right. from, like, shipping, correct? For sure. Yeah, and it's all uh, super deliberate. Yeah. I'm going to jump on because transparency is a lot to do with my work. And part of I see my role as an artist and a professor to try to get people to understand information around what's in their food. So there's not a lot of transparency in the food system, and that was one of the topics yeah. that got covered in the last panel. And I spend a lot of my time teaching about food and climate change, which is an incredibly depressing and scary topic. So I'm constantly scaring the crap out of my students and depressing them. And one of the ways to ameliorate that is to use design to make some of these very foreign and very scary you know, propositions a lot more accessible. Can you give an example of some of the work that your students or you yourself are doing that uh, explain yeah. this idea? Yeah, so I teach a class um, at ITP called Biodesigning the Future of Food, and it's attached to the organization that Lauren just meant it, mentioned called GenSpace, which is a citizen science institution. And what we do is um, we work with biotech and scientists, with designers and food study students to try to solve for issues around the food system. So last semester, four of my students did this incredible project called Ecosystem. So they're trying to address colony collapse disorder through the varro mite, um, which is one of the reasons cl uh, colony collapse disorder happens. Climate change is another one, and pesticides also is attached to that. But what they did was they built, they're building a 3D printer that extrudes mycelium, which is a mushroom, mushroom substrate, and it makes the hive resistant to varro mites. And they're also working with these two uh, other students, these two women who are creating beer using genetically modified yeast and because wheat is going to be threatened by climate change. And so the byproduct of this beer process is something called beta acids, which is also varro mite resistant. And so what happens is you have this really interesting circle. So the honey that comes from the hive goes into the beer. The beer gets processed, these beta acids go into the hive, and they're trying to reduce colony collapse disorder and make some really rockin' beer. And the design is incredible. So they're all like design students, and it's beautiful. And so you don't necessarily have to know anything about climate change. 
it's like drink some good beer, and then the collateral is like you're saving the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny that you mentioned the transparency because I feel like that's a very big part of what we focus on at Sprouts.io as well, because so many people just want to know what actually goes into their food. And it's not just about it being organic or locally sourced, which all of these things are good, but at the same time, what does that really mean? What does that mean if your food is organic? What actually goes into your produce? And so a big part of what we do is we make everything transparent. The nutrients that we use, where our seeds are sourced, the growing medium that the plants are growing in, all these different aspects because we feel it's really important for you guys to know exactly where your food is coming from and actually participate in the process of growing your food and being a part of that. And so I think for us, we really look at, you know, we, we call the produce that's grown from Sprouts IO personal produce. And a big part of that is every person who's growing with Sprouts IO is involved in the process of growing and also involved in the output of what that produce is. So if you want a tomato that's sweeter or more savory, you can actually grow the produce to certain ways depending on the lights, depending on the watering, etc., to personalize the produce. And so um, when we talk about design in, in food in general, um, you know, I think what we try to do is create a kind of framework for people to be able to grow really easily, to be able to see exactly what goes into their food. But really, it's up to you, right? It's up to you to grow it. It's up to you to use it in, you know, your dishes that you're creating for your friends and family, and hopefully sharing that with the people that you care about and you love. And so it's, it's more than just where the produce is coming from. It's about creating experiences around food and meaningful experiences for people um, to really take ownership of their food and where it's coming from. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Jenny, because that's something that uh, we at Mold have been really thinking a lot about and really pushing forward is the role that design can actually, designers can have in uh, cultivating and creating a personal relationship between consumers and the food themselves. So um, I would love for you guys to talk a little bit about how uh, your products actually, and the work that you do actually, um, engages people with this idea of having a personal relationship with their food. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and why this is actually really important, uh, not only for, you know, uh, potentially uh, resolving, potentially addressing the coming food crisis, but also um, as a business. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I, I launched this business, is so that I can maintain people having a personal relationship with food. I saw the sort of future of food conversation going in a few different ways, and didn't like some of the things that I, I, I saw, and the best way to address something that, that bothers you is to, to, to take action about it. Um, and I think there's something that's so wonderful that comes from having real food, the pride, the joy, the education, the culture um, that goes around that. So I think that, and, and, and sort of the, talking about the education part, that, that's everything for us. Um, you know, we need to be out there at events like this, sampling our product, talking to people, um, answering people's questions that they have, but we're very much about the transparency of it, very much about, you know, helping people kind of overcome their, their concerns with trying something new. And really, it just ladders up to, to for us, it, it change. You know, and change is something that takes a, a little bit of time for people to get over. Um, and then once they do, um, it becomes a lot easier from there on out. But having a sort of, you know, a connection to the, to the food we eat is, is really at the core of what we're doing. Um, and, you know, I would, I would add to that that, you know, it's easy for us in a major urban area to, you know, think that oh, it's, it's great to you know know every single thing that goes into your food, and I agree, we would all love to do that, but not everybody has access to food that allows you to do that. Um, so one of the things that's wonderful about Frozen is that we're able to access people in in food deserts throughout the country who you know their only option is what's available in a pretty generic supermarket. Um, we deliver directly to people. You know they don't have to worry about that. Um, you know and also one of the things that we're able to do is we're able to use a lot of ugly produce um, and you know utilize it in a way where. 
nobody cares. <laughs> no one's judging it. Um, so, you know, just as far as, as personalization, I'd say that, that that can tie very closely to access and what that means throughout, you know, different, um, different communities within the U.S. Uh, the other thing is we've built our, our product and our platform so that people can, can you know, have changes of, of taste, you know, within their own uh, ordering mechanism. So, you know, if, you want, if you're feeling like coffee one day, that's great. If you want something fruity the other day, you know, the next week, that's great. And we've, we've kind of built our platform so it really can flex to personal taste and personal desires. And do you think, does that actually affect consumers in the way that they waste, or like the, the kind of amount of waste, that they, food waste that they would produce? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, just the ability to use ugly, ugly fruit, um, you know, and the fact that something that is frozen is not perishable, um, you know, but without the nutritional compromise that usually shelf stability, uh, you know, brings into play there, um, absolutely. You know, it's funny, I feel like the personalization part is so key and important because I feel like, well, so initially Sprouts.io began as research in a more academic context and um, at one point I was working actually with the Boston Public School System and we were growing uh, in middle schools with kids that were, it was a fairly rough neighborhood. Um, you know, they didn't have a lot of access to stuff like broccoli and cauliflower and different types of produce that, you know, they were, they, they didn't have exposure to that. And so one of the things that we did was that we grew in a, a then previous version of Sprouts.io. It wasn't Sprouts.io yet. Um, that came a few years later. Um, but the students actually were growing the produce and they were preparing meals with the produce and they were taking the produce home to their families and introducing their parents to the types of produce that they were growing. And so that's when it really like clicked for me um, was that when people are involved in the process of growing, when they care about where their food is coming from, they don't want to waste it. If you grew that tomato and that tomato is delicious and you nurtured that produce to get to that point in time, you're not gonna throw it away. And it was the same thing for me growing up. You know, I had a backyard and a garden. Unfortunately, I don't have that now. So Sprouts IO is, is what I use and frankly, it's very convenient. So I'm happy about that. Um, but it was very difficult getting access to like tomatoes that actually had flavor when I left and didn't have a backyard garden anymore. But every one of those tomatoes that we grew in that garden, I would, you know, use and drop off to my family nearby and drop off to my friends, and it's because we grew them. And so I feel like that's a really important piece is that people need to be involved in understanding. And that's not saying that everything that you're eating, you're gonna grow yourself. But I do think the closer that we can get to our food and having an appreciation for it really changes the way that people think about their food in general and makes smarter decisions for everyone based on where their food is coming from. Because if you grow it, when you go to the grocery store, you're gonna to wanna to know where your food's coming from. You're gonna to wanna to know the farmers who are growing it. And so that's really important in order to look at these large problems in food, as Lindy is mentioning, you know, how are we gonna feed people 20, 50 years from now? There's gonna be more of us here, but we also have to take action in our food, in our food system as well. Yeah, I'd like to, to, to say, it's like not just how are we going to, how do we want to. So connected to that is this thing about relationship, but also agency, and how do you give people agency in the conversation about their food system? And I think that design is a really great way to do that. And I think what design has done, if you look at it historically, I mean, you can conflate design and marketing. And if you look at, for example, Happy Meals, and Happy Meals targeted to children, and the design of the packaging, and the colors, and all that stuff that gets targeted to kids, can also be used for adults, that I think specifically using design as a tool to bring people into the conversation, because I think, like for me, I'm not interested in telling people what to eat and what not to eat, and what's good for them and what's bad for them. I'm not a nutritionist, right? But I think the transparency is about giving people agency, letting them make the decision on their own, what they eat, what's in their food, how does the food get grown, how is it distributed, and design can do that because if you have something that's attractive or people can have an entrance into it without having a scientific background, 
without having any kind of education around their food system, it opens the door in a much more democratic way. So I see design as a democratic tool to be able to give the science, to give the information to the public in a way that's playful. So in my classes, I often use very unconventional tools to do this. I spend a lot of time teaching South Park to my students because if you think about the way that the show is structured, it's designed in the most crudely fashioned cartoon you know, renderings possible, and people feel really disarmed by these little creatures, right? You laugh, they talk about all sorts of disgusting things. However, they tend to tackle a lot of the really divisive issues that a lot of um, media outlets or other television programs won't because they're super controversial. So you can think about ways of getting information to people without it being didactic and having them turn away, and I think design is the way to go. I'm so glad you mentioned this, Stephanie, because this really kind of drives to the heart of our conversation today, which is the question is like, how should? And that is a real question for, the, for designers in general. So I'd love to kind of, as our last question, um, ask each of you, um, how should we be thinking about designing um, a future food system that, that in my mind is, should be more resilient, that should be more sustainable and more transparent? I'm going to just start again. Um, that's why. So I think part of resilience and part of sort of feeding the food system, and I think somebody in the last panel talked about that it's not a matter of not having enough food produced, it's a matter of distribution and a, I mean, an issue of access. But I think partially why that information is not so available is I think that the food system is too um, divergent from each other and that for me design is bringing scientists and artists and farmers together in a room and policy people and bringing everybody together to design a system that is more meritocratic, that addresses issues from all of these different spheres and, and, and sectors and it's a way to use design and bring people together because when you, bring, when you talk to a scientist, they're super brilliant and they talk scientist to scientist. But if you bring an artist in or if you bring a writer in, they're able to take that information and bring it down to a place where things can now be designed in a way that people have more access. So for me, it's about designing for accessibility and you can't do that in a vacuum. And I think you need to bring as many divergent stakeholders in the food system, which is kind of everybody, frankly, um, to having these conversations. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would hop on exactly what you just said about, so, about accessibility, and every time I turn that way, it rings. <laughs> but, you know, kind of adding on top what I had said before around, um, you know, food deserts, and, uh, you know, just using all of the food in our system through making sure that you're utilizing ugly fruit as well, and you know, it really does come back to, down to access and transparency. So I think right now is a really exciting time because there are a lot of really interesting people starting to do things in the food space. Not starting, I mean a lot of people who have been doing things in the food space, but I think right now we're seeing an excess. I mean even the fact that this event exists right now, Food Loves Tech, right? Ten years ago, in, actually ten years ago when I started developing some of the ideas behind Sprouts.io, people were not really thinking about this at all. They weren't thinking about technology and how technology could potentially influence food. And so I think right now is a really great time for people to get involved in this process. And for me, you know, I think a lot about how design and technology can help in thinking about the food system. And I think there's a lot of people who are, who are like, you know, does design or technology, does that take people away from their food? Because it's not, you know, this kind of picturesque idea of going out into a farm and your own berries and produce or you know I think that there's got to be a lot of solutions in the future for looking at our food system and looking at you know how we can really grow sustainable food for more people and so you know I think in, in our case Sprouts.io is one solution but we really think about technology being able to enable more people to have access to these types of tools with whether it's growing their produce or other aspects around their food. But, um, so sometimes I'll get this question, like, do you feel that technology takes people away? And I actually feel it's the exact opposite. I feel like technology can really open up a whole new kind of lens on these processes. So for instance, I know we've talked a little bit about this before, but um, you know, our system incorporates a camera. And some people are like, wow, a camera for your produce? Um, 
But we do that because it allows us to look at the health diagnostics of the plants, but at the same time, it also enables all of our users to actually see how the plants grow over time. Most of us don't even understand that. They exist in a totally different time scale. Plants are a total mystery to us. Um, but when we use this technology to open up this new way of seeing things, that's really exciting because it enables us to live with plants and produce and understand this kind of bio, well, feedback between one another. And so I think that's really interesting when you start to incorporate food technology together and look at new ways that we can actually grow, new ways that we can incorporate technology to make our food system better. But I just want to add something to what Jenny said, is that it's not technology as like a blunt instrument to, to just like force something on other people, but really technology as a tool of design, and design being the leading kind of um, uh, uh, process for that, so that we can humanize technology, that, so we can use technology as a, a way for people to actually get closer as opposed to some technologies which I think are actually um, distancing us from where it comes from. Well, I completely agree with what everyone said. I guess there's a reason why we're all up here together. And, and I think that's a point that I, I try to make is that we have the solutions here. Everything we need is here, it's just a matter of how we're using it, how we're using food waste, how we're increasing accessibility how we are using technology to bring us closer to each other and the food we eat and not distance us. And I think that there is a other realm of thinking out there that we do need to invent something completely new and that we won't be able to eat the way we once did and that you know these new solutions need to um, arrive for the future of food. But I believe that we, we do have these solutions here. Now, for instance, Crickets, are, are, they, are they new? Well, well, yes, they're new to us here in America, but huge swaths of the world are eating insects as a form of their diet, about 80% of the world. Here in America, this was one of the oldest foods that we had. There's sort of traces of American, uh, Native American tribes eating sort of grasshoppers and, and petrifying them in salt. Really interesting thing, so it's the oldest food. It's eaten um, in 80% of the world right now, so it's a solution that exists today, um, just not in our culture. And we all have a responsibility in this room, I think, being here that we are in America, a lot of the world looks to us and to how we should eat and what the food trends are. And I think we, we all have the power to direct where things go. And um, I'm happy that you're all doing the work you're doing because I couldn't agree more with everything you, you said. Uh, one thing, just a funny note that I've recently learned about insects and uh, entomophagy around the world is that if you think about it, most insect eating cultures actually are tied to the grain crops that uh, are, are actually produced in those uh, geographies. So for example, um, if you are growing certain types of corn, then you're probably going to end up eating the pests that are uh, actually attacking the corn. So in kind of piggybacking the conversation that we were talking about earlier about GMOs and um, and uh, fertilizer. I thought that was a little interesting tidbit that I recently learned. Anything else? Um, yeah, let's open up to questions. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Question is um, with the increase of uh, Americans and North Americans interested in eating insects, what impact do the, does insect farming itself have on the food system? Yeah, that is a, a whole category that, uh, with a limited time, I didn't get to get into today. But the sort of technology and the way that we're using technology too, it's in sort of a parallel way to um, have cricket farms. The benefit of having a cricket farm is, first of all, the affordability of crickets. The whole system will be able to be automated so you're able to get a high quality product at a very small price. 
Um, and also farming them doesn't sort of deplete uh, wild sources or open yourself up to um, getting crickets that had maybe been sort of eating pesticides or something that you wouldn't want to consume. And the farming can be done in a very modular way so every metropolitan city can have their own sort of cricket farm and cricket source. They're very sort of, uh, uh, sort of simple. Um, you know, being, and so they have about a four month, I'm uh, sorry, four week lifespan, um, and the sort of understanding how to farm them is, is sort of, um, is, is, is already there. So, cricket farming is a major innovation, it's really exciting, it gives us a sort of a local and a stable food source, it can sort of build economies, it can be sort of transferred back into developing nations where they are already eating crickets and other insects as a form of their diet. It's incredible. And our crickets that I work with them often ask, where do your crickets come from? Good question. Um, our crickets come from Texas. <laughs> the, the question is, what do crickets eat and how do they compare to red meat? Um, amounts of... Yeah. yeah. So if, if I'm holding sort of a, a pound of red meat and a, and a pound of crickets, so say um, crickets will have three, crickets have three times more protein. Um, uh, so I think they're the most sort of protein dense um, food on the planet. And in terms of what they eat, they can kind of eat anything. Right now, the crickets that I am sort of uh, using, they are fed sort of a vegetarian grain feed. But when I raise crickets at home, because I'm sort of like, I don't raise the crickets, I work with a farmer for it, but the crickets that I raise at home, because I feel like I need to just experiment with this on our own, they can eat anything. They can eat food scraps, I feed them apple peels, carrot peels, and I think there's also a major opportunity out there for um, also some innovative chefs to influence the flavor, because they're so small, they do really take on the flavor of what they are eating. So what would it be like if they lived on like a basil-only diet? Um, I think that could be pretty tasty. The question is, um, given inequality in our conversation around access, how can we use design as a vehicle or as a tool for um, addressing the question of access, food access? I'll try. So I think part of it has to do with the public and educating the public. So much of, like, here's a really good example. So Hunts Point in the Bronx is the largest food distribution center in the country. Right? So like $400 billion of food comes in and out of the Bronx every year. The Bronx also has the highest level of food-related illness in the country because of food access. And not many people know that. So why is there such a disparity among the people who live in an area where all this food comes in and out? There's fresh directly, there's all of these um, businesses where the food lives. And so how do you use design to do that? Part of it is getting the information out there. But I think that like, where does the agency come from? The agency comes from buying with your dollars, or voting with your dollars, and voting with your votes, right? So that if we get people to understand this information, because a lot of it is politics, and a lot of it, like if you hear politicians talk about it, they talk about it in a language that is not accessible to people, and people have absolutely no idea that they're even that close to these food distribution centers, right? So for me, the way that I think about it is, how do you design a system where the information becomes accessible? And how do you create educational systems for children? Because I think children are a really good way to start. Children are like sponges, and if you get them interested in having good food, they're gonna go to their parents and demand this good food. And so it has to start young. There's a, I see someone in the audience who works with the Green Bronx Machine, Stephen Ritz, who is out in the Bronx, and what he does is he is teaching kids how to grow food in the schools, and these are kids who don't have access to food. And it goes back to the earlier point about having, a, what Jenny was saying, about having kids have a, a participation in the growing of their food. So I think part of it is both sharing the information, but also designing really cool farm systems for kids to use in schools so that they demand it. And then also having the public know where their food is coming from, how their food is produced, and being part of the legislation. So for those of you who don't know, the Farm Bill is coming up 
under consideration for 2018, and the Farm Bill affects everybody. And if you're really interested in shifting access, you need to learn, you know, for people who have the time to look into this legislation, you can vote for the people who don't to get access to the food uh, to people who can't. Does that answer your question? I, no, I yeah. answer your question. Okay. I, so it's um, so I think of access in a little bit different way too sometimes, and I think a little bit of it more from the design side as well. Um, I think in what we try to do with Sprouts.io and what we continue to try to do with Sprouts.io is provide access through thoughtful design, and so. Um, a lot of people write into us and they say, you know, I have a black thumb, everything I try to grow, I kill, I've tried to grow everything from potted plants to try to set up growing systems, and I think one of the things that we were trying to do is just make it really easy for people to jump in and start growing, um, because I think that there are certain tools that are out there, some that are DIY and some that are just, you know, putting seeds in the dirt and hoping for the best and maybe you put nutrients and what do I do, how do I grow this? There's a lot of confusion around like how to actually grow stuff because it's it can be very complicated. And um, part of what we try to do as Sprouts.io is simplify that process through the design of the system. And so we make it, you know, very easy to use, very easy to maintain. Literally, you can plug in the system and it starts to grow. I mean, we say you need water, which the water you provide every four to six weeks. It's incredibly efficient with the amount of water that it uses. And Wi-Fi, basically, so we can connect and look at the data and provide you know, growing profiles, which are essentially these kind of recipes for growing different types of produce and system. So, Part of what we do is we make it very easy for people to just start. And what I love and what gets me up in the morning is that I see, you know, our users and people that we've tested with, including the chefs that we work with, that you know they start to grow with it. And once they feel confident and comfortable growing with it once, growing with it twice, then they want to start to tweak and change things and customize the way that the produce grows. And that's really exciting to see people take that kind of ownership. And so I think it's a little bit of a different kind of accessibility. But I think that's, you know, our focus is making it very easy for people to just jump in and grow and grow well. And kind of speaking to what Jenny is saying, um, you know, one of the things that the Young Farmers Conference, uh, which is held at Stone Barns Upstate, is addressing is this question of uh, tools for farmers, to, for, for small to medium scale farmers. The fact is that in the United States, uh, farming tools are not manufactured for um, farmers that have small to medium sized farms. So if you are a product designer or a mechanical engineer, um, this is a really straightforward and easy way to create certain types of access by empowering people, whether they're farming in, like gardening in their backyard or farming with an acre of land, to actually do the work that they're supposed to do. Um, if you're interested in it, you can look up the Slow Tools uh, working group of the Young Farmers Conference. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, the question is, uh, given that there's a lot of um, kind of logistical problems, like issues, not issues, but logistical challenges for growing an a independent frozen food company, um, how do you address those things? Yeah, so um, it really comes back, it all comes down to sourcing, uh, as you, you kind of mentioned. So we have a, uh, a really large sourcing team, um, and we have relationships directly with our farmers. Um, so, a lot of people will ask us, why are you not 100% organic? Like, why are you not organic certified? One, because I don't think that that's the most important thing. Um, but two, you know, it's because we are partnering with a lot of farmers who may not be organic yet, but we're partnering with them so that they can become, we're, we're partnering them in a transitional organic capacity. So, we don't have to go to the farmers that a lot of, um, a lot of bigger producers or bigger companies have to use. Um, because they're not as quality as, as we would like them to be. So you know, we source for quality, we source for safety, and we have 
we, we know the names of our farmers. We know, you know, their birthdays. <laughs> you know, and, and we know exactly where our food is coming from and how it's produced. Um, and by doing that, we're able to, to sidestep a lot of those issues. Um, thank you so much to every, first of all, can we just talk about how awesome it is that there's all women on this stage? Um, but thank you guys all for taking time for joining us in this conversation. We're going to stick around for another 15 minutes if you want to speak to anybody specifically. Otherwise, uh, stick around for the next panel at 2.30, which is about how we will buy groceries in 2050. Thank you.